Hi, Freya. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be talking about this and I'm, yeah, I appreciate your willingness to dive into this. I saw you, or well, I listened to you on another podcast and you made so much sense about life, everything that I haven't been able to quite figure out in my mind and haven't really known where I fit in and what my views are. You've, you've just articulated everything so beautifully. You made so much sense. And I thought this conversation has to be shared to as many people as possible. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, what I'm going to share today and what we're going to talk, talk about definitely isn't like, you know, uh, new information that I've come up with or it's all being taught to me by other women. Um, and this is, this is how it happens, just like one conversation at a time. And I'm sure that you will go on to um, have these challenging conversations with other women in the future. So, yeah, Sure. Before we really dive deep into the topic we're going to talk about, I would love to know a bit more from you if you could explain really briefly, well, or as long as you want, what a radical birth keeper is and mm-hmm. radical feminism, what that is as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I call myself a radical birth keeper, um, which to me, what that means is that I serve women in pregnancy and birth and really anywhere along the continuum of womanhood who are seeking, uh, who are very intentionally seeking non-medicalized, sovereign, autonomous home birth experiences and who want another woman to walk with them in a way that is rooted in authentic sisterhood and um, integrity and trust. And that is not about uh, you know, me as the birth keeper, heroing her, um, but about, you know, to me being a radical birth keeper means being so, you know, solidly grounded in my own truth and my own power and uh, my own boundaries that I can walk with another woman who is, you know, also interested in that exact same thing through pregnancy and birth and, um, you know, I intentionally also work outside of the medical system in the same way that these women are intentionally seeking births outside of the medical system um, because of our, because of the current state of our birth culture, including the regulation of midwifery and what that has done um, to our birth communities and how, you know, modern midwifery is is not really midwifery at all anymore, but um, a very medicalized profession. and how this is kind of tethered to, to radical feminism, I think, is that, you know, they both contain the word radical, which, um, you know, I think some people, the first thought that comes to mind is like out there and crazy and, and that that is what radical means. But actually, um, you know, to be a radical is, is more of a political term and it means to go to the root and uh, to have a particular analysis of of the world um, that is really root, yeah, rooted in the root and in coming back and asking questions and, and getting to like the, the basic assumptions that underpin you know, all of the institutions in our world, whether that's you know, birth, radical birth keeper, or um, radical feminism. And it's also not about reform. So you know, as a radical birth keeper, I, I'm not a doula. I don't work in the system. I don't believe that the, the uh, that modern, obstetrics or the hospital system can be reformed. I don't think it's broken. I think it's doing exactly what it's designed to do. And I think that the the root, but like assumption at, at the heart of um, modern birth is that, you know, women are broken and faulty and kind of like gross and disgusting and need to be saved um, by doctors, essentially. Mm-hmm. And radical feminism to me is would just be what feminism is but you know we kind of have this distinction between between radical feminism and liberal feminism Uh, and really to me the the gift of radical feminism i mean it's such a such a huge topic of, of what does this mean but it's it's about it's the difference between 
uh, equality feminism, which would be like liberal feminism, and then uh, feminism that is rooted in liberation and the liberation of mothers and children, um, Mother Earth, and even men, you know, from um, this kind of like death <laughs> culture uh, that we live in right now. Um, and it's about not just looking at our individual experiences, but sharing, you know, honestly with each other as women, the reality of our lives and beginning to make sense of our experience and see the patterns. So like for me, what happened when I found radical feminism is like everything just made sense all of a sudden. I actually realized how deeply my experience in the world was informed by my femaleness, you know, by my physiology and by the ways that as women we are oppressed based on our physiology. Um, and I realized that, you know, so many of the things that I thought happened to me um, that were just random or like my fault or, you know, I actually realized happened to like every other woman that I know, <laughs> right? And this is this- Like what kind um, of thing? Well, so, you know, let's take, let's take birth coming, you know, staying with through this through line of, of birth again, like every single woman leaves the, leaves a hospital, leaves like an institutionalized birth, believing that she's broken, right? Or believing that, and not only that she's broken, but that she is uniquely broken and specifically broken and that it was her fault or her baby's fault that whatever ended up happening happened. Um, and it's not until you get 40 women in a room together to share their birth stories that you realize like, oh wait, 20 of us had C-sections and then we were all told they were emergencies. Oh, we all had inductions. Oh, we all had vaginal exams that we didn't want to have. Oh, they all told us that our baby was going to die. Like, you know, that's how we can begin to see the pattern and realize that what happened to us, you know, and what happens to, to mothers within uh, the hospital system isn't happening uh, to us as like individual women that did something wrong, but as to women as a class, right? And to like all women who are entering in that system. Or for example, like if we're talking about um, sexual assault and rape and um, that that's made to be like a very individualized thing and like you did something wrong as a woman to, to cause that to happen. But actually this is such a common experience, right? And once we start to talk to our friends, we realize how many women have experienced sexual assault and it's, you know, so much higher than, than what is being reported. And then we start to see the pattern and we get to ask questions and and see that these things aren't happening to us because of like who we uh because i'm freya but because i'm a woman in a world that hates women like very deeply right and that is rooted in um exploiting our femaleness and um and and yeah, so as like a political analysis, radical feminism, I mean, there's like many, uh, you know, stances that it kind of becomes known for. So like, you know, radical feminists um, have a very strong critique of uh, the prostitution industry, uh, pornography, surrogacy, and then also um, the transgender ideology movement. Um, and where we're going to go to today in our conversation about female erasure and, and one of the like core um, like political perspectives of radical feminism is that women are oppressed uh, and exploited for two, two things. There's kind of like two, two pillars. One, we are exploited for our reproductive labor and one is for our, and the other is for our sexual labor. And both of those are tied to our physiology, right? To our female bodies. Um, and a really core part of having a political movement and to be able to speak about our experiences as women is to be able to speak clearly and articul articulately and accurately about all of these things and being able to use the words women and mother and breastfeeding. Um, and to you know speak accurately about our anatomy and our physiology and 
that so much of the way that you know patriarchy operates and continues to sustain itself is by controlling language and that um as women we have to like reclaim our words and you know, like midwifery for example has been stolen from us like the word midwifery has been co-opted um by states the world over through the regulation of midwifery that word no longer belongs to women like that's why we are you know using all these other words like birth keeper radical birth keeper um because that word has been stolen from us and now you can only be like bestowed that word if you go through a medical school and like bow down to the um you know medical industrial paradigm mm -hmm. um and right now the word women <laughs> is being stolen from us and who does that benefit and uh it's obviously not women as we're we're going to get to today and this is what we call you know female erasure within the radical feminist world um yeah that was a lot <laughs> oh that's great do you know what it's, it's interesting because i've sort of i've actually feel like i've been very anti-feminist for the last however many years because i just assumed that feminists it, it seems like there's a big movement at the moment where feminists are saying we think that women need to be equal to men we need to put women in positions of power women need to be the ceos and i've been to things like networking meetings where i sit there and i go oh my goodness like i feel like i'm the only one there seems to be a lot of man hating there seems to be women just want to give birth bottle feed drop their kids off at daycare and go and have massive careers yeah we're basically CEOs. like taught that like this liberal feminism essentially says that like the path to power is to entirely negate your femaleness right and to like pretend that you are not a woman um and to you know to come to numb your your femaleness to control it to um to temper it to medicate it away and to just like basically act like a man mm -hmm. and um to achieve power within a man's world which i don't i mean oh my gosh sorry that's not my um like i i don't that's not what i want <laughs> yeah. you know i'm not i i think that this this world that we live in this you know death machine like um sort of hellscape that we find ourselves in like i have no interest in in creating or finding power within that world um i'm like far more interested in creating an entirely new or ancient way of living that's actually in alignment with um with the natural world and and i and i personally believe and i and i think we share this belief that um as women our power comes in aligning with our femaleness right and with mm -hmm. um and that there's nothing more powerful than being able to create life and birth and um and to have those as sovereign autonomous experiences and that it is actually our natural um physiologic experiences as women um that are like the last remaining opportunities to connect with our like sovereign female fire and power and again like this is why birth is so hidden and so villainized and the truth about birth is so silenced because if women were birthing in power and if women were emerging from their birth experiences, um, you know, not only not traumatized, but healed and transformed and connected um, to the fullest expanse of their power, we would live in a completely different world. <laughs> um, and so... I feel this is reflected yeah. as well, sorry to interrupt, in the wor world that I also work in, in terms of the period side of things. It's like, if it's all become so medicalized, okay, things aren't working. Well, let's go on the pill. Let's uh, perform surgery. Let's actually cut out your uterus because it's not working. Let's scrape it out. Let's operate on it rather than actually getting to the root cause of what's going on. And to sort of parallel with this, I almost feel like 
women are experiencing more fertility and period problems, and this is probably quite controversial, is because we're living a more masculine like energy life of fast paced, do, 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 go, 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 work, 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 rather than tapping into that feminine energy. So it's, mm-hmm. I think so much of what you're saying of just feeling supported and feeling nurtured and cared for as a woman can make a huge difference in yeah. the world. Really. Yeah. And like the words that I use would be like, I speak more about like femaleness and because I, I think that these concepts of masculinity and femininity are like so fraught and also so um, tied in with the whole uh, transgender ideology and female erasure. Um, Ooh. Okay, so, let's get into this. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Please explain that then. Okay. Yeah, so I, I guess maybe let's, first of all, just kind of frame this conversation around transgender ideology to be really clear that this is about this is in no way about individual people right this is this is at when you're uh having a radical analysis we're talking about the ways that particular ideologies and institutions um and we're we're critiquing these bigger, like wire, wider scaled phenomena, not individual people ever. And I, this is not about individual people, people's choices um, or a judgment on individual people. So um, sort of the like conservative approach to, to gender and sex is like, there's no different. There's no distinction between gender and sex, right? There's like male and female and all women, are you know uh belong in the camp of femininity and they're you know kind of um and and all of the tropes of femininity apply to women and then men are are all meant to be masculine and they're like they're these two are tied together gender and sex and then there's the liberal um analysis which is what's mainstream right now which is that there is actually no such thing really as biological sex. Like biological sex doesn't exist. There's only gender. And it's just like one big fun spectrum. You know, you get uh, men on one side, women on the other, and then there's like a whole gray area in in between and that this is liberating, right? And that we are, um, that it's so transgressive to to play with this like gender spectrum and to, pretend that biological sex doesn't exist. The radical feminist analysis is that sex is a biological reality, right? There is male, there is female, and then there is a very small percentage of people who are intersex, which to be really, really clear is is very, very different from uh, someone who identifies as transgender, two completely different groups of people. Um, And that biological sex is extremely real. We are a sexually dimorphic species. And uh, it is very important to be able to speak about the very different experiences of men and women. Um, And then there is gender, which is a social construct, right? These ideas of masculinity and femininity. um, And that, you know, like masculinity is, to make it very, very simple, you know, in a way that you would explain to children that it's like boys wear blue and boys like sports and soccer and cars and um, girls like pink and dancing and like being more soft and quiet and boys like to be like very bashful and outgoing. And that this is masculinity and femininity. Um, And that not only is gender, masculinity and femininity a social construct, it's actually a hierarchy, right? Where where men are above women and masculinity is above femininity. And that this uh, construct of gender is actually like an integral um, tool within the patriarchy to keep women uh, subordinated and to justify our oppression. And so as radical feminists, um, the, the approach really is like gender abolitionism. 
mostly, which, which, which basically have to explain that one. Yeah, so which, <laughs> which basically means that that no matter what sex you are, it does not matter if you're male or female, that you can express yourself in any way. You can love whoever you want. And you can have any set of characteristics or likes or dislikes or forms of expression. And that all of the, the spectrum of being a human is available to every single human, no matter um, of your biological sex. Um, and like the critique of, well, there's so many, but you know, the, maybe the first place we'll start with around like trans transgender ideology is it's really sold to us as being like progressive and liberating, but actually what it's doing is um, further entrenching these uh, constructs of gender, right? It's saying, okay, if a boy likes pink and he likes dancing and he likes other boys, he's actually a girl. And, and the same the other way around that, oh, like these girls who um, like playing sports, who uh, wear blue and like other girls, they actually are just born in the wrong body. And they should, in fact, um, transition to being a boy. And that that's even possible, right? Um, which to me is obviously not progressive, right? Like this is deeply homophobic. And, and one of the things to know is that, um, that I think this might be changing just because of, but I don't know, but I assume it is because of how fast um, the rates of, of surgery and hormonal therapy is changing in North America. But um, Iran actually has the highest rate of sex reassignment, you know, sex reassignment surgery. And that's not because Iran is like woke. <laughs> it's because homosexuality is legal um, oh. in Iran. And so uh, it becomes really clear the ways in which transgenderism is actually oftentimes about presenting as like heteronormative, right? Um, and we also know the rates of young lesbians that are essentially groomed and coerced into um, transitioning. So yeah, there's, there's that whole layer of it. And then there's also just that right now we're having language stolen from us, right? We can't use the words women and mother and breastfeeding without being called bigots and transphobic and all of these other, you know, labels that, that do not accurately articulate um, our critique of this ideology at all. And who does this serve? Like, who does it serve to not be able to talk about the very specific experiences we have as women? Because as women, we are oppressed based on our physiology, based on our femaleness. Um, and to no longer be able to speak about that um, does not serve us, right? It only serves the people in power who um, benefit from keeping that power dynamic um, hidden. And yeah. So when you when you talk about sort of words taken from us, you mean when people say things like chest feeding or people have periods and people give birth rather than breastfeeding, women have periods and women give birth, right? Yeah, so birthing person, womb haver, cervix owner. I'm sorry, um, what? A womb haver? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> a womb haver. Interesting. Right, which is like, and it's, a womb haver. I don't oh identify God. as a woman, right? Like, I do not identify as a woman. I am a woman. I am female in every single cell of my body. I will never not be female. And this concept of like, being a cis woman, which means that you get privilege by identifying with your femaleness, um, to me is, is so offensive because I don't identify as being a woman and I don't identify with the oppression that I face because I'm a woman, right? Like if this was as simple as identification, then all the women the world over who are experiencing female specific oppression, okay? So we're talking female genital mutilation, surrogacy, um, 
being denied access to abortion, um, rape, obstetric violence, um, you know, abuse from their partners, um, like child, um, being a child bride, or like, you know, all of the ways the world over that we, that only women experience oppression because it's based on our physiology, that if they, if they had just identified out of being a woman in that situation or a girl, that they wouldn't have had to experience that. Um, it doesn't, it, it's, it's like deeply offensive because we don't just get to identify out of being women and out of like living with the reality um, of our femaleness. And this is kind of the illusion, right? There's this, and this is another piece that people aren't speaking about, um, which is, you know, asking the question of like, why would young girls want to transition? and want to present in the world as, as boys or men, well, it's very obvious for any of us who have grown up as girls, um, you know, and faced, you know, any level of sexual abuse or sexual trauma. Um, and then to be told that you could just be a man and, and to, like, it's a path to safety, right? Right. Um, and so it really makes a lot of sense. And, um, I think it's an, an also important to touch on this idea of like gender dysphoria, because I think that, you know, as a lot of people have so much empathy for that, and I completely do too, especially women, I think that every single woman understands what gender dysphoria is like, because we've all probably experienced body dysphoria, right? Like deep body hatred. And um, for me, I don't think it's possible to be born in the wrong body. I, I simply don't think that's a possibility, but I do believe very strongly that it's possible to be born in a culture that teaches you to hate your body, right? And what woman hasn't experienced that? <laughs> like we yeah. all have, and we would never say to a girl who is struggling with anorexia or bulimia, like, oh yeah, you should be 80 pounds. Like that's healthy, right? Like we would never practice affirmative care with children who are struggling with that kind of body dysphoria. Um, but if you um, question the practice of affirmative care around gender, then you're like immediately a bigot, essentially. Why um, is that? That's, I, I've actually had the same yeah. thoughts because I used to work in um, a mental health hospital with girls with serious eating disorders. And if they were mm -hmm. to, they actually believed they were fat. But according to this, you know, the way that the political correctness is going we should be going oh you believe you're fat okay you are but then these women would die like they they won't get the care they need so what is the difference that's what I'm curious I like think, I'm genuinely curious why yeah so I think that then this is like zooming out for a, a bigger like political context and really asking the question like how has this become so popular so quickly mm. right how is this movement so fast and if you look at the rates of surgery and hormonal therapies in children like it is it's extraordinary like we're talking like a hundredfold like it's it's growing so so fast and and i think as always it's important to follow the money and to understand that that transgender ideology that that this movement is essentially like a big pharma movement, right? Because what's what's happening is that they're taking children and turning them into lifelong consumers of experimental hormonal therapies. And they're getting to perform, you know, major experimental, very uh, profitable surgeries, repeated surgeries um, on, on children and on adolescents. And so there is so much money to be made um, within this industry. And I also think that it's, it's also tied into so many ways of this like um, pandemic situation, you know, thing that we find ourselves in as well. And that if you can, can like the, the ability to identify somebody's sex is, is not a, um, cultural uh, 
culturally learned ability. This is like innate. <laughs> you know, I'm a farmer as well as being a birth keeper. And I can tell you, like, we know this is one of our most like primal instincts is to be able to, you know, out of the corner of the, our eye or by smell or from a silhouette to distinguish whether another person is a man or a woman. And that's both because we are reproductive, you know, sexually dimorphic um, species. And also as women, because it's part of being able to protect ourselves from, from the sex that is, you know, the one that oppresses us. Um, and so I, I, I do think that if you can convince people that biological sex isn't real, and, if, and by that I mean you can convince them to play along and pretend, because I don't think that anybody actually believes that biological sex isn't real. Everyone's just pretending. But if you can convince people to do that, is there anything you can't convince them of, really? Like, I, I, it's a very sincere question. <laughs> like, I don't, I really wonder that. So there's, there's so many layers, but I think that primarily the difference, but the reason that we don't talk about body dysphoria in the same way is because there is nowhere near as much money to be made. Um, That's so interesting. That. It is interesting. Yeah. I mean, it does, it does scare me having you know, having a child and thinking like, what if you get to a point where you're not comfortable in your body, which I think so many kids go through, they, they question their identities, they question what's going on in the world. I mean, back in the day, I remember a girl in my primary school and she was classed as a tomboy because she didn't follow the girly rules. But yeah, I feel like in today's day and age, that would just be, you'd go to the doctor, they'd put you on medication, you'd have surgery and you can become whoever you want to be. And, and it's, I'm and it's, kind of it's, afraid it's of a medicalized world. It is. It's, it's very, very scary. And I, and I, I believe that it's child abuse. Like I, I am very clear that, that that's what it is. And I, I, I do not think a child can consent to, and to understand the, the lifelong consequences because it's, it's also, they're also being castrated. So like these children who are being put on puberty blockers and these hormonal therapies from very young ages, like their fertility is, is gone. Children are having like their healthy, girls are having their healthy breasts removed at like 12 or 13. And they're having their uteruses removed from their body. And again, this is like such a mechanistic perspective. Our, <laughs> we need our uterus for health. We need our ovaries for health. Our breasts play a vital role in our body, but it's, it's also alongside this entire um, medical approach, which is like, just pop this pill and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Like just cut off your breasts and all of your deep inner wounds and pain and, and heartbreak and trauma are just going to go away. And it's not true. And there is a massive community of detransitioners, which are, are completely and completely hidden. Yes. Um, they're not, they're not given platforms anywhere. And imagine what that's like, you know, to have, to have been, let's say you're, you're a lot, you're a young lesbian and you were sexually abused as a child. And then somebody just kind of said, well, maybe you, maybe you're trans. And then you go into the internet, um, platforms where basically children are, are being groomed, um, it's really obvious if you go and you, you know, you follow the YouTube channels, you go into the comments, um, children are taught how to, um, you know, navigate these conversations with, with their parents and essentially like threaten suicide if they don't, um, agree to, to having surgery. And then let's say you're, you, uh, went on puberty blockers, you went on testosterone, you cut off your breasts, you've taken out your uterus, and then, and then what? And then you're still, like, it didn't solve the problems. Like, it didn't, there, there's no healing that happened there. there. There's absolutely no healing at all. Um, and, and that's so real and so heartbreaking. And that's why, just like, one of the million reasons why I speak about this issue so much, because I, I can't even fathom. But you're yeah. brave to be doing this because like, it feels like it's such a controversial topic now. And if you talk about it and your views aren't like welcoming for this movement, you are 
um, discriminative or whatever the word you, you're you're like a bad person because you don't tolerate people it's like homophobic or whatever the words are like you you're transphobic and it it's it makes you feel like a terrible person but actually you know we're, we're not loving the people as they are the people no. like the people are going to cut off all parts of their body it's not you're not helping someone love themselves for who they are you're telling them to change who they are i'm just so confused yeah and i and i think that this is like really important to ground back into is like okay why why question this why speak out about this and for me it's really Mm. clear it's because i love women and i love children (laughs) and and to me this is profoundly anti-women anti-life um and abusive to to children and so um and it's and it's very easy to get confused within and like that's just one of the tactics that they use to keep people silent right because if you don't if i think most most women have this like intuitive sense like something's a little bit off here but like i want to be good and nice and respectful and like i don't want to step on anybody's toes so i'm just gonna like go along with it um and it's really framed around like, well, don't you care? Like everyone, they're all going to kill themselves if, if, um, if they don't get these, um, surgeries and you're a bigot and you're so judgmental, but like, I know, I know that I'm not. And it's, it's so clear for me that I'm not. And there's, um, and also to speak about this, uh, this specific point around, um, people will always bring up like around suicide and the kind of line is like, wouldn't you rather have, especially given to parents is like, wouldn't you rather have a child who's being transitioned than a dead child? Like that's used all the time to coerce, coerce parents into um, agreeing to these surgeries. And you know, it's the same that happens in hospital birth. Like, well, do you want a dead baby? Like, and it's also the same tactic that abusive partners use with women, like, well, I'm gonna kill myself if you leave me. Um, and to be really clear, and we can put this in the, um, you know, tag, I guess, underneath the, the podcast, my friend Isabella has an amazing resource guide on all of this. The statistics around suicide and um, suicide rates going down um, after children have been transitioned are not accurate. And and that's, that's, that's simply just, not true and and I believe is like propaganda. Um, And then there's one other piece which we have to to touch on around this, which is um, the very important political ramifications for changing what the word women um, means. So I live in Canada and in Canada, um, our laws changed a couple years ago so that there is essentially no such thing as biological sex under the law here. So anybody at any point in time can identify as a woman or a man. Uh, It doesn't matter whether you have had surgery, how you present, not that I think that that matters, um, but you can simply identify as a woman or a man. And what does that mean? Well, that means that every single thing that feminists have fought for, you know, in terms of legal sex-based protections under the law uh, are essentially rendered meaningless. So we no longer have female-only spaces. We no longer have um, female-only prisons, female-only women's shelters, female-only bathrooms, sport teams, um, political positions, scholarships, you know, We no longer have um, uh, sex-based violence, like sexual assault and rape, being accurately reported. Uh, You know, and and again, who does this serve? Because it is, by and large, men who rape women, right? And now we cannot speak accurately about who is doing what to who, because these words are um, legally just mean whatever at this point in time. and so another reason why I think it's so important to speak out or, and why I do is because it's about 
protecting our most marginalized women from male violence. So in Canada right now, there are women who, and it's important to understand that women in prisons, um, that, that female prisons are very, very different from male prisons, right? Because women aren't in there for violent crime by and large or sexual crime. They're in there for um, like drug, drug crimes primarily and, and like trying to provide financially. Um, but there's women in Canada who are being forced to share their spaces, like they're literally locked in with men, with men who identify as being women. Mm. So now women are being sexually assaulted and raped inside of female prisons by men. Wow. And also, you know, women's shelters, which where is where women go when they're escaping male violence, right? Um, now men are in those spaces. And I, you know, in my hometown, actually, two women a couple of years ago were kicked out of our local women's shelter because they spoke up about their discomfort of sharing a room with a man because they were escaping male violence. Um, but because this man identified as a woman, there was literally nothing that um, the women who ran the women's shelter could do to kick him out because under Canadian law, that would be like discrimination. Um, there's just so many consequences. And then we also have to think about like female only bathrooms. <laughs> like, again, these are things that, that people don't really realize, but like feminists fought for female only bathrooms because we have very particular <laughs> physiologic experiences. We menstruate, you know, and we know that, you know, in, um, in developing countries, for example, that like one of the most common reasons that girls don't get access to education is because they they bleed and they have no like support uh, in that in school and no like safe spaces to to go and deal with that physiologic female experience. Um, and so, what does that mean for all of the girls in Canadian elementary schools and high schools who? like could find a boy in their changing rooms or bathrooms at any point, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like these things are, are, yeah, so real. So, or like, you know, a woman, like, so what about if a woman is raped by a man, but the man identifies with a woman and then she is forced in court to call him a woman? And that violence is recorded as female on female violence, even though it's actually, as always, you know, male on female violence. Mm -hmm. So it's this bigger, there's so much more to this issue and we are not allowed to ask these questions, you know, yeah. even though there are so many consequences for children and for women. Um, and it's, it's made to be just this like issue of identity. And like, if you just cared enough about people, then you would let this go. And we're meant to ignore all these bigger political ramifications. Yeah, that's a really good point. Cause I've sort of, I've had these conversations. I've tried to be open with it. And I, I, I'm honestly, I honestly come to these conversations and say, I don't understand, like, please explain because this doesn't make sense to me. And the response is like, why does it matter to you? Just, just let it go. And there's something inside me that's like, but, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. So, so what you're saying, you know, makes sense. And there's also this other side that I don't quite get in that people are transitioning. Like I'm trying to work it out. What, what starts, what, what are they born as? It's like the, it was it a, a bi no, a biological woman will start, will have, will identify as a man, but then will give birth. I'm like, but isn't that the most womanly thing that can happen? And then it's like the news articles, like a man gives birth. I'm like, but what? And I just am, and I, I'm almost afraid to say this on the podcast because I'm afraid that people are going to listen and go, wow, Jodie is such a bitch she's so discriminative she just hates people how could she but I'm genuinely just confused yeah oh, and, and it's, it, 
this is like intentional. This to me is like the biggest gaslighting of all time, right? Where we're all meant to play along in this game that we all don't know that it's a lie. When every single person knows that it's a lie, right? Like we know that men cannot become women. They cannot because plastic breasts don't make you a woman. Injections of estrogen don't make you a woman. The um, inversion of your penis and removal of your testicles doesn't make you a woman, you know? And, and like identifying as a woman doesn't make you a woman. Wearing a dress doesn't make you a woman. Shaving doesn't make you a woman. Being pretty and feminine and soft and whatever doesn't make you a woman. Mm, you know, it's really like, interesting. Now I has, see what you mean is, by the feminine masculine thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sense. Because like I could be like, you know, I don't shave, for example, like that is a stereotypically feminine thing. What if, so if I don't shave, if I have short hair, if I date other women, if I am like loud and strong and courageous and does that, you know, I, that, that doesn't mean that I'm not still a woman. I'm still a woman. It has nothing to do with how I identify or dress or express myself. It is like woven into my cells. Like it's, it's inextric inextricable from who I am. And there is no moment in my life in which I will not be a woman. Um, and so that's it really beautiful, is beautiful though. That's so beautiful. Gospel. Sorry to interrupt that, but yeah. that is so beautiful because it, because it's just, it's essentially saying like, let's just love ourselves for who we are, wherever we're at on this, totally. what is it? The gender spectrum? I don't know. I'm like, what's on a spectrum here? But like, wherever you are, whatever your body is doing, whatever your preferences are, who you like, what you want to wear, how you want to live your life, that shouldn't matter. Yeah. But you're saying like, let's stop denying biology. Yeah, literally all I'm, what we're saying is be who you want love who you want, express yourself how you want, but love your body. There's, there's nothing wrong with your body because of it, right? And who profits off of you hating your body, right? Yeah, yeah. And we're not talking about the fact that, you know, the children who are transitioning, what, what kind of sexual health are they going to have for the rest of their lives? Like their ability to experience pleasure has just been taken away from them. Their ability right. to create life has been, you know, oftentimes taken away from them. Um, and there's, you know, great lifelong health consequences of all of these, um, like hormonal therapies. Um, so for them I and the planet, I almost feel like, what is, yes. where are these hormones going? Totally. Well, it's like, we talk about the, re about how birth control, um, you know, is poisoning our rivers and like making fish, like male fish. And you know, it's the same when we're, and I just, I never... Fundamentally, you can't be born in the wrong body. Our bodies are not broken. Our bodies are safe places to be. And, um, and to me, that is liberatory. The answer is never surgery. And it's never um, like hormone therapies. But we have to understand the path that this goes down. So right now in Canada, a new law is trying to be passed, which essentially equates um, questioning um, somebody who identifies as transgender with conversion therapy, like gay conversion therapy, which has been, which is illegal. So what this would mean is that a therapist, if a child came to a therapist and said, I think that I'm a man, or I think I'm a boy, or I think I'm a girl, if the therapist did anything other than affirm that, they would be criminalized. I mean, that's obviously like insanity, right? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's blatantly not, not okay. And, and so, I'm yeah. Where this world is going to go. I thought I, I got on this and I'm like, I've got to be really impartial in this conversation and not share my views, but it's all coming out. I, it just, it scares me. How do you think we can teach our children to love themselves? And what if, you know, some, what if kids hate themselves and they really believe they are born and, you know, it's such a real experience to me. I've never had that. I, I've got to be honest. I've never had that. I was, I was the girl that was wearing tutus and wanted to do ballet mm -hmm. and like the very sort of feminine side of like the, whatever, <laughs> what am I saying? So I never experienced that 
feeling like I was born in the wrong body. Although there were, I say that there were points where I'm like, oh, I'm too thin and I'm too this. And I'm, there, there was definitely body dysmorphia for yeah. sure. Or body dysphoria. What's the body dys? I think either. One of them. We'll go with one of them. But yeah, I definitely, I did experience that. And I guess mm-hmm. I kind of, I mean, is it the same? I've never had that feeling like I was born in the wrong sex body. How mm-hmm. can we even begin to help kids or adults love themselves? Is it possible? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's absolutely possible. And I think, I do think that the first step is becoming politically aware and, and advocating because um, these, you know, pharmaceutical companies and the people who are benefiting from transgender ideology are predatory, right? And they are in our school systems, like they're talking about transgenderism before they're talking about like homosexuality, right? And so they are absolutely um, educating our children into this ideology. Um, and and also as parents, depending where you are, like you may or may not be able to um, say no to your child being transitioned, even if you know it's wrong. Like I know, a, um, what are the exact details? I think this is either in one of my province or another province in Canada where a father is losing custody um, because he doesn't agree with the transition of his child. And so I think there's this like first layer where, parents really need to become politically aware of this issue and, and, and um, like be active, you know, like women in the UK, for example, have really um, been on it and, and been like fighting really hard um, to keep women's sex-based protections. Um, so I think there's like that level first of like really um, gaining consciousness around this issue And then I think also like the first step is to model that, you know, yourself for, for children, but just to always, to speak really honestly about these things with children, you know, and tell them like some, some children are taught that they're born in the wrong body and, and um, it's just not true. And, you know, we live in a culture that really teaches us to hate our bodies. Um, and there's people who profit off of that and this can look all kinds of ways. And this is one particular way. Um, Do you think yeah, we actively just- need to speak out? Like if we see, cause I'm part of this, um, oh, it's like an entrepreneur journalist group on Facebook and someone posted, we're launching some period pads for people. It's all about people having periods. And so many people were going, yes, brilliant, genius idea. And I'm like, I'm sorry, people have, per- people have periods. Do you think yeah. we need to actively like jump on that and go like, this is not true. Or we just let it pass. Like how, mm-hmm. how do we regulate our own emotions if <laughs> we don't feel this way? Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to speak out. I really do. And I think that, um, it's important to call out other companies to make it known to the people in your life where you, because this is my experience. Okay. Is I've spoken about this publicly in so many ways and, um, and I'll not lie. I've, I've absolutely had real world consequences around like my employability and, you know, other things happen <laughs> because I've spoken out about this issue, um, which is not okay. Right. Like that's crazy that, that women are losing their jobs. Um, they're being fired. They're being like criminalized because they speak out um, on behalf of women and children. So, I mean, that in of itself should be already reason to, um, be enraged about this issue but I my, what my experiences of, of speaking publicly I mean now I, I do people who follow me are like very aligned and and so I, I have a lot of solidarity but you know being out in the world what's gonna happen is you'll speak people will like virtue signal and tell you you're evil and all this stuff and then you'll receive like 20 DMs <laughs> being like I kind of secretly believe believe in you like thank you so much for speaking out um because most people understand once most people have never thought of these questions and once you just ask a few simple questions people will kind of be like yeah like 
I, I get where you're coming from, you know? And I have a video on my Instagram where I ask like, I don't know, it's a series of like 20 questions and it's, it's a lot. You kind of have to maybe watch it multiple times, but you know, using, using some of those questions can be really helpful in conversation. Um, and also, you know, if you have a public profile using the word woman and mother, <laughs> right? Like there's actually, you know, quite very few birth pages, like big public birth profiles that still use the word women. <laughs> Um, or people oh in women's health, like everything is where women are being erased. And so even just using those words and standing firmly in that um, is already um, so huge. Um, mm -hmm. And that I think you'll be surprised by the number of people who, who do align with you mm -hmm. and who, um, and, I'll, and it is, it is terrifying. I, I totally get it. <laughs> I, yeah. You know, I've been in plenty of conversations where I'm literally like shaking and, you know, now I've been thinking about these things for, for so many years and have had a lot of practice. And so I feel more confident doing it. And so I, but I do recognize that it is scary. Um, and that it's all just practice and that one-on-one -on -one conversations I find are a lot more fruitful. Yeah, you're a brave, amazing woman to be speaking about this, and you, you do make a lot of sense. It's a lot of sense, a lot of sense, hugely. And I'm so grateful that you've given up your time to talk about this and share your views. It's it's really, really interesting, and it's it's also food for thought, especially for me. You know, thinking about this feminine, masculine thing because I'm definitely all about. Well, I have been all about the feminine energy. I'm like, yeah, tap into your feminine energy. But now I'm. I've got to have to give I mean, this I some thought. Like it's female, like female that energy. is your female, like life force, creative energy, right? And so that's, I mean, that's how I, and I, and I, I do, you know, I have maybe softened around this and I think there is more nuance around these like archetypal feminine, masculine things, but I think it, yeah, it needs to be, that territory needs to be treaded with a lot of care and, yeah. um, with a lot of like political understanding of, of the ways that those um, of like what those words mean and what they reinforce. And um, yeah, one, one other piece I'm just thinking of that we didn't touch that I find is a useful question to just like get people thinking is, yeah. so where does, where does it end? Right? Like, so if we accept transgenderism, then we have to accept trans ideology as a whole really. Like, so what about um, trans racialism or trans disabled or trans aged or uh, trans indigenous? Like, so, you know, if I really just have always loved, um, you know, wearing like traditionally tanned clothing and like feathers in my hair and um, sweat lodges and drumming, like, does that mean that I, I, I'm indigenous? Like, do I get to identify as indigenous? And like, what does that mean for actually yeah. indigenous people and their legal protections? Or, you know, what if I really identify with black culture? Like we, we most of when people have heard of like Rachel DeLiesel, who um, was a white woman who like was pretending to be a black woman basically. And everyone like condemned her and that wasn't allowed, but what is the difference? Like really, what's yeah. the difference between that and transgenderism, right? Like I don't, I don't see any difference at all. Yeah. Um, it's interesting so, about the trans age, is it trans ageist? Because yeah. so many older people are like, I still feel 21. Well, I mean, if we could have surgery to make us 21 again, would we? Would that right. be? Or what about pedophiles, right? Like yeah. I, oh, yeah. I identify yeah. as a child. Yes. You know, like, yeah. because, like, and, and yeah, it's, it's, um, there's so many layers. Oh, another piece that we didn't touch on, um, is autogynophilia, which is, which is basically that, uh, like the sexual, a sexual fetish basically around like female oppression. And that for, uh, my, in my understanding, the majority of like adult men who choose to transit, like transition and, you know, pretend that they're women, um, it's like related to, to a sexual fetish basically, and like getting off on female oppression. 
And so, you know, how is it that like a middle-aged white man can go from being, you know, like quote unquote, the most like privileged in our world to suddenly like the most oppressed person overnight as soon as they identify as a woman. Um, and yeah, there's, there's like a whole dark hole to go down in that, in that world too. So yeah, just to keep pointing out like more and more layers to this. Where do you get all your research and statistics from and all this information? Where do you get the information from? I mean, there's many, many radical feminists who have been like boldly and very intelligently speaking out about all of this for a long time. Um, My friend Isabella Melbin, her uh, Instagram page is Whose Body Is It? And um, she has a resource guide that I'll I'll send you the link to afterwards. It's free. Um, And that would be like an amazing amazing starting point for for women who are like just this is the first time they've heard any of these questions and don't know where to uh begin yeah Mm. thank you Mm -hmm. it's so it's so interesting Mm -hmm. it's a big big topic and like i said before i'm so i'm so grateful you've you've spoken out about this and you're brave enough to talk about it and to share it and there's a lot of food for thought there a lot of food for thought I can't wait to see what the feedback is <laughs> um that's amazing and if people want to find out more about you where can they find you yeah so the best place is Instagram I am very active on Instagram it's Freya Kellett um f-r-e-y-a-k-e-l-l-e-t um and you'll you can find the link to my website and um all of my offerings through there amazing Freya thank you so much welcome yeah thank you for your willingness again it's um i know that it's brave takes takes courage (laughs) that's we're gonna save the world (laughs) awesome